Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is a Ukraine War Update Extra video, giving you extra nuggets and information to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war that's going on. Um, I'm going to do a couple of sort of picking up bits and pieces from previous videos to sort of clarify. I previously said that that all these equipment and personnel that has been reported as going into Belarus, we've seen train loads and train loads of equipment, and I've shown that to you, going into Belarus. And I've said there are two options here. One is a feint, uh, which is that they are sending a bunch of stuff up there to fool the Ukrainians into thinking there's going to be an attack from the north, but actually there's going to be attack. there's going to be an attack somewhere else, uh, but then that is kind of bizarre because wouldn't you want that equipment to be in that somewhere else? Wouldn't you want that equipment to be used on the front line somewhere rather than being sent for this sort of complex feint? Um, so I, I think that would be a ridiculous use of that equipment. Uh, the, the other option is they're genuinely going to do that attack. But again, I think that's ridiculous because there are there aren't enough troops and pieces of equipment to, to successfully take Kiev. I mean, they couldn't take Kiev when they had their full army trying it at the beginning of the war. So some sort of second-rate, third-rate, poorly trained troops with a bunch of second-rate, third-rate equipment uh, and possibly with the help of the Belarusians attacking uh, to Kiev or Lviv, I don't think will cut the mustard. I think it will be political suicide for Lukashenko, um, although he may no, not have any choice in the matter because his defence um, minister was assassinated by the Russians for not towing the party line. And he was kind of towing the party line, but just not enough. And he ended up uh, dying recently and the understanding is that hey Lukashenko you're next if you don't do what we say so there could be this internal battle literally as a person going on with Lukashenko saying well I don't want to I know it's going to be deeply unpopular with my with my uh, population uh, and my army but I if I don't do this I'm literally going to be assassinated uh, but the idea is that there, there are these marshes and, and bogs and rivers up to the north around here uh, as well as the northern border being heavily mined and defended it would be very difficult without huge amounts of bridge building equipment for the russians to come down through here to say lviv and even to kiev it's just i just don't think they have enough capacity to do that and the capability to do it so again i think that's ridiculously stupid and a poor use of their their troops and equipment but there is a third option that has been pointed out to me which is that Actually, this could be equipment that's being sent that needs is in dire need of repair. Uh, and so they're sending it to Belarus and it could act as a feint as well. But they're going to repair the equipment or get it ship shape so it can be sent down to the front lines. Um, again, I'm not sure what that says about all the troops. Um, are they just being sent for training? Uh, are some of those vehicles going to be trained on? I think that's that's a good option and arguably could be the most sensible option. I mean, in principle, I think that's probably the best option, but I don't think the evidence necessarily holds up there because the the equipment that's been sent has looked fairly in good nick, like it has just been redone, uh, given a paint job and whatnot, and fairly usable stuff. So it doesn't look like it's old mothboard equipment that's going to Belarus to be uh, to be uh, fixed to make it operational. So actually, I don't think the evidence points that way, although that is possibly the most sensible of the three options. I still don't really know why they're sending troops and equipment en masse to Belarus because A, it's not en masse enough for, for any kind of offensive and B, it's a complete waste of the troops and equipment. So there's that to uh, clear it up, hopefully. Um, someone said uh, on one of my comments today, we've never had any, there's talking about Britain, we've never had any real impact militarily. So why the hell are we holding on to any military equipment in this case? I mean, talking about sort of modern times, really. Uh, we, our army is, is quite small, uh, although, you know, it's, it's got a good reputation and we have good equipment. But, you know, if you, if you were to push the British army just a little bit, it would probably... It's probably not as robust as one might think, just merely because we don't have enough stuff, right? Because of underfunding, and you can really understand underfunding because we've not really been at war. So why spend billions on, you know, getting newer tanks or more tanks or more people uh, in the army and this and that when actually we've got schools that are horrendously underfunded? I can tell you this as a former teacher. Uh, and you've got, uh, you know, say the NHS or whatever thing that needs to be funded in, in in the economy the military is going to come way down the list 
with an economy in a country like the UK, given the last 20 years, right? Okay, now things are changing, but it needs a war to change this to, in order for us to go, okay, we might need to invest in our armed forces, but I'm not a war hawk, actually, despite what you might think. Uh, so I wouldn't have justified, I, I would have argued against piling billions and billions into our armed services previously, but now we're in a situation that we're actually, you know, we have a problem and the problem is Russia and arguably China may be going forward. But you get, then get the situation that exactly here, why why don't we just, why are we holding on to our equipment? So that equipment, those Challenger 2 tanks and all the other stuff that we're giving was designed to like the AS-90s, uh, SPG, self-propelled guns that we're giving away, were designed to defeat Soviet um, equipment. So uh, we now have a chance to, to, to literally to fulfill the design criteria for that stuff, to send it against the stuff it was designed for and our outdated stuff particularly. We are not going to have a war in Britain. No one's really going to invade Britain. And as I said before, we we are part of NATO. So you've got you know, Article 5. Some people say, oh, we still got to keep hold of a certain amount of our equipment as part of the NATO criteria and all this. But we are in a process of upgrading Challenger 2 to Challenger 3. But we're not upgrading all of our Challenger tanks, some 300 odd tanks. And actually, 79 tanks are going to be divested, which means we're going to probably try and sell them off, do something, whatever, but essentially get rid of them. So we have 79 tanks that we could that aren't going to go to battle in Britain and they aren't going to be part of our, our future army. So what are we doing not giving 79? If we really wanted to give Germany and, you know, Rammstein a kick up the arse, then we give 79 tanks, say, look what we've done, there you go. But also, and this comes on to, I had a, a hopefully, a, you know, a really nice conversation with someone who disagreed with me, um, who said... You know, stop, stop uh, slagging off the um, the Challenger two tanks because you know they're a good tank. You know, stop bashing them. And I was never bashing a Challenger two, and, and we had a nice conversation about this. Hopefully, hopefully he thinks that way. Uh, Challenger two is a brilliant tank, right? But if but giving fourteen of them is not enough, right? That is is not a game changer. As good as that tank is, and it's one of the best tanks in the world. You know, of all the modern tanks, you know, you've got the Leclerc, you've got that, Leopard 2, you've got Abrams, you've got K2, you've got these tanks that are, that are capable. The Challenger 2 is a good tank. I'm not bashing the Challenger 2. However, 14 is not enough. You have bespoke ammunition. It doesn't fire NATO ammunition. And only Britain and Oman use the Challenger 2 or thereabout, there or thereabouts. In, in other words, there isn't a large proliferation of the tank, which means that there isn't a, a, a great depth of supply for spare parts and, and knowledge about how to maintain the tank. In other words, we have to give a very bespoke um, logistical channel from the UK, essentially, of parts, of expertise, of ammunition. And that is not particularly useful for the Ukrainians, as in that is a challenge. The Challenger 2 is a challenge for the Ukrainians. They would prefer something like leopards, where loads of countries have got leopards. And that means that loads of countries can help with expertise and uh, main maintaining the equipment and supplies and so on. So what really the uh, Challenger 2 was about was kicking... Uh, Germany into gear to r change their export clause to allow Leopard 2s to be, to be given, to allow other nations who are very willing to give Leopard 2s to Ukraine. So it wasn't, and in fact, Ukraine, the latest podcast said exactly, Dom Na Nichols said this yesterday, which is great because sometimes I get the imposter syndrome. It's like, do I know what I'm talking about? I am not a military expert. I am a random philosopher on the internet talking about stuff that I'm vaguely obsessed or very obsessed with. But I sometimes think, uh and Dom Nichols has said, said exactly that, and he's a former tanker, saying that the, the Challenger is a good tank, but all of what I've just said. Uh, and it, it should be seen not intrinsically uh, as intrinsically valuable to the Ukrainians, like 14 tanks isn't going to change a lot. It will help, but it ain't going to be the be-all and end-all. However, 
It is arguably extrinsically useful, which means it's going to have value in what it can bring, the Leopard 2. Rammstein is happening on Friday, which is where 50 countries get together. Lloyd Austin, the US Secretary of Defense, will say, right, what can we give Ukraine? And hopefully big stuff's going to come out of there. Hopefully a bunch of leopards. Hopefully that you will see uh, a huge piece of news. That's my fingers crossed hope. Um, but the UK played its part in that with the Challenger 2s, and that's brilliant. However, I go back to my point, which is why not send 79 of them? Because you can overcome that meagre supply uh, problem with some kind of scaling it up by saying, instead of giving you 14 and we're having to put this like supply thing in place and it's a bit, uh, we're going to give you 79 of them, right? We're going to give you as many as we can without like s damaging our own kind of future ideas about our own armed forces we're going to give you 79 of them and we're going to sort out a really robust supply network that's going to to help you maintain those tanks and give you ammunition for them because uh, with 79 we're going to have to commit big time to that why don't we do that i don't know then that would be more like the game changer that that this chap sebastian was saying uh, when challenging me like the the challenger 2 is not a game changer 14 tanks uh, any of any tank in the world even if it's the best tank in the world by a country mile is not a game changer you've got a big front line to cope with you've got offensives counter offensive tanks break down um you know for yeah 14 just ain't enough so let's look at the what the Br british are giving um the war zone this is the drive and excellent they every time you have these big uh military aid donations they do a breakdown and it's always fantastic uh so much to talk about here uh obviously the challenger 2 main battle tanks we've got 30 as 90 which are quite old school equivalent to soviet era um self-propelled guns it's got the same turret as a crab the ahs crab which is a polish one uh, useful uh uses um pretty standard ammunition get it out there it's not particularly fast um, but it will it will do it will do a job uh, and will, uh, eight at the moment then a further 22 to go later in differing um states of readiness which i think you know it says that yeah we had a bunch of these in in storage and uh half of them have probably fallen apart but we're going to give you as many as we can right now and then we'll keep trying to build them up to send them on to you uh the other big one is the uh, possibly 100 bulldogs bulldogs are these sort of upgraded um apcs that uh that we have uh, promise the fv432 the mark 3 bulldog so it is an upgraded one that happened uh well let's actually re, re well first of all let's read what we're giving so 14 challenger twos um which is equivalent to a british armored army armored squadron uh together with armored recovery and repair vehicles so that is interesting it's not that the because you get different versions of challenger and you can get challenger based like arvs and whatnot and actually this is right 14 actual challenger 2s and arvs and repair vehicles so that as cool uh as i say eight as 90s and 22 further uh, making a 13 total hundreds of other armored vehicles so not some people are saying 100 it's hundreds okay this is, this is potentially pretty huge uh but we don't really know exactly what. There's an unspecified number of FV-432 Mark III Bulldogs. These aren't great. These are kind of equivalent to the M113, which is the US uh, armored uh, APC, tracked APC, that, that's um, been around since the 60s. The same with the FV-432 being around since the 60s. But this is an upgrade from after... Uh, our initial engagements in Afghanistan it then got upgraded. You can put a whole bunch of stuff on it. Uh, but anyway, uh, we'll come to that in a second. Uh, a maneuver support package that includes minefield breaching and bridging capabilities. Super useful. Dozens of uncrewed aerial systems specifically to support Ukrainian artillery. I think it's like 20 million quids worth maybe of drones or something. Something like that. It's, that is cool. Some people are saying the next one is the biggest one. 100,000 unspecified artillery rounds. We will be not providing them from our, from our own stocks almost certainly. We'll be going to other places. I don't know, Pakistan, wherever, Australia whoever has them and we'll say yeah we'll have a hundred thousand then thank you very much and we'll ship them off to ukraine so it's so it's, we're using our kind of purchasing weight to be able to do that hundreds of sophisticated missiles sophisticated missiles which will include the the gimler's missiles to be fired out of things like high well high as well the high uh and other similar 
uh, guided multiple launch rocket systems. Um, and Star Street surface to air uh, surface to air missiles and examples of an unknown type of medium range air defense missile. So don't know what that is. I don't know whether we're going to be sending more brimstone varieties and stuff like that. And a support package with spares for tanks and infantry fighting vehicles already in Ukrainian service. So this is uh, Noel reports was getting excited about this because this he was saying this could put you know entire. I don't know, whatever companies, brigades, where he was sort of getting ahead of himself, maybe uh, back on the road for Ukraine, and that could be really, really good. So it is a substantial aid packet, and and well done. And Ben Wallace has been really strong on this, and I said in my news bit this morning that he he was using the right rhetoric, which was this is about expelling Russians from Ukrainian soil, not about defending uh, Ukraine. It's not. It's about not stopping them losing. It's about allowing them to win, facilitating them winning. So it's now you and I'm hoping Ramstein will continue this, which is and this isn't didn't start with Britain. It start you know the Bradleys and actually we've had several weeks of ramping up the military aid. But hopefully we'll see a bit of a policy shift now and we'll start seeing offensive weapons because that's the only way we're going to get this over and done quickly. Like the only way that Ukraine war ends in with the fewest number of deaths right is if it isn't protracted now if if we so now's the time to say we'll just give you everything like there isn't going to be another war with all of all of these countries involved unless we all go to war with china like it's going to be it's russia or nothing right so and china is sitting back going and, and looking at this they kind of want russia to lose so they can take advantage of russia but they're also kind of allowing russia to do the kind of recon work for what the west is made of and what the west has got and and if we don't look to be far superior to russia and work really well as a as a, as a team then china will will be will be very interested so there are so many reasons why we should give as much as we can to ukraine now the protracted war kills more people a quick war get it over and done with and get russia out and have some kind of uh political implosion in russia as a result of them getting getting uh a bloody nose here anyway sorry uh starting to uh rant or something uh so uh, uh talks a lot about the tank and uh, so on and so forth i mean yeah, it depends what kit the can the tank comes with it comes with as well. So there is this TES configuration, the theater entry standard. Uh, so it grows to almost eighty three tons. It's a heavy tank, and some people are worrying that actually it's too heavy for some of the bridges that that might be used in um, Ukraine as they are going across maybe small rivers and whatnot. It's just too heavy. It is a heavy tank. Tanks with a TES kit have add-on armor modules, including explosive reactive armor. Uh, arrays and slat armor screens to help defeat various tiers of infantry uh, anti-tank weapons. It also has um, a 7.262 uh, uh, 51 mil gun. Uh, so it has two of them. I think one a free range one on the top and a coaxial one that points in the same direction as the turret. Uh, so on and so forth. Um, uh, it's got... Uh, uh, on a, uh, an electric warfare jammer, primarily intended to disrupt radio-triggered improvised explosive devices and improvised s improved sensors for better generational situational awareness, among other things. TES is sometimes referred to as a Megatron kit, after the nickname given to a Challenger 2 that the British Army uses to test various upgrade packages. So, would it come with all that e extra stuff? You know, you'd hope so. That'd be cool. There's also other configurations: Street Fighter. Street Fighter 2 um, has a box on top meant to uh, simulate a possible add-on launch system for brimstone missiles, etc., uh, etc. Et so, you know, what it comes with, it, we don't know. Uh, but hopefully, you know, as much stuff as possible would be great for the Ukrainians. So unlike the Challenger 2s, UK Defence Secretary uh, Wallace specifically mentioned the Bulldog configuration of the FV-432. So FV-432 is part of the FV-430 family, the initial production of which for the British Army began in 1962. So as I said, pretty much analogous to the M113, which is old school, you know, it is out of date now, but you can use these for getting troops around, not necessarily on the front lines, but, you know, moving them around the theatre uh, from A to B with some degree of um, 
protection and they they'll be perfectly fine for that you, if they are coming as a bulldog variety then hopefully they will have more protection and more capability um so uh, the bulldog was a substantial upgrade um in the 2000s this variant the first of which entered service in 2006 has a new engine and drivetrain because it is not fast this bad boy um uh, that give it increased speed and better cross country mobility as well as air, an air conditioning system not sure they're going to particularly need that in uh in ukraine so go the the f fv 432 does only go 32 and a half miles an hour it ain't um uh, it ain't quick um so yeah at least 500 of these bulldogs uh exist uh, in that upgraded form um so it also was designed to be fitted with add-on armor so it can be fitted but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to come with that and additional survivability features including additional armor protection for the gunner on top Eat that so you can see it there. ERA and slat armor packages on the side hull and an IED jammer, which we sort of saw on the Challenger 2. So this is what it looks like, but this is with all the added bits of armor, you know, on on the side. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's what it looks like driving. Uh, that is a bulldog. And at least 100 of those. Well, no, we don't know. Hundreds of... of um, vehicles armored vehicles of which there will be a bunch of bulldogs uh and then these as90 self-propelled howitzers out of an original fleet of 179 the british army currently has around 89 still in service and is actively exploring replacement options it's not clear how many more st may still be in storage after having been retired over the years that could now be readily sent to ukraine well, of course you know they aren't actually the ones we're sending they eight i think are ready now but the other 22 are not ready to send which is why we're not sending them obviously there's got to be training that takes place as well um so it, this is this is all good this is all about you know saying to everyone else well what are you guys doing this is kind of brinkmanship virtue signaling in a way but that is really good i i advise everyone tries to virtue signal with their um with their equipment just send more and you can say how wonderful you are it doesn't matter just get it out there and we we can have a race as who can who can be the most wonderful in supporting ukraine that's a positive thing in my book because we get to the same place and hopefully you get there quicker um yeah so uh all this sort of stuff this is a really good article as i say um the uk will be uh, will begin training the ukrainian armed forces to use the tanks and as-90 guns in the coming days as part of the wider uk efforts which have seen thousands of ukrainian troops trained in the uk over the last six months yes and twenty thousand more this year so that is fantastic too uh really good to see the uk getting um so involved here um there, there you go. That's uh, uh, and there's much more I can say, but that's probably enough for now. So here we have no report saying Poland has already handed over 260. T-72 tanks of various modifications to Ukraine. President of Poland, Andrzej Duda, who is, they are loving him at the moment, the Ukrainians. He is very popular. Um, now that Boris Johnson is gone, he is basically your number one iconic leader, I guess. Five days ago, he said, I announced our decision regarding Leopard tanks. One company of Leopard tanks is about 14 tanks. We have indeed decided to send them to Ukraine, but we hope and try to organise more support for Ukraine. So again, they're sending those, or they seem to be saying they're sending those tanks, although Russia, uh, Germany still hold, you know, the keys to sending them. It's whether this has already been decided behind closed doors that Germany will allow this and they're just waiting for the decision at Ramstone. I don't know. Uh, but it, it, that could be the case and it could be that, that indeed these leopards and many more will be sent. But back whenever several months ago or a month or so ago ukraine gave a list of what they wanted is their kind of christmas list and they said you know we want this amount of stuff this amount of stuff this and they said 300 tanks so again if you go back to 14 tanks for challenger 2 great that we're given in challenger 2 but 14 is is what some small percentage of 300 they really need a substantial number of tanks uh and yeah as i say if we'd given them 79 challenger twos and then they get what 150 leopards i don't know that's probably never going to happen because i don't know that they're being phased out in the, in the same way or maybe they are 
for certain um, configurations in the same way that Challenger 2 is being phased out. I know it would just be lovely if, if everyone just said, right, here's, here's everything you need uh, and fulfilled the, uh, the request. Right, now, time to talk about Arestovich and the missile that hit Dnipro. Now, what happened is we had the cruise missile attacks the other day and a cruise missile was said, in fact, there's different claims coming out today, whether it's actually an AN kitchen missile or something, but a missile hit a, an apartment block in Dnipro, which is a, a city, a residential city, and it is not a military target. And this, this was terrible. Then... Uh, and the footage of that is horrible. I'm going to show you some footage, give you the context. Um, and then uh, we had the, the kind of Russian narrative saying, oh, it was an air defense missile that took out a, a Russian missile that was going to hit some infrastructure. And it was the taking out that missile. It was either the air defense missile or it was the actual cruise missile that had been taken off course by being hit by air defense that landed. And, and that's what caused it. So therefore, it's a Ukrainian's fault. Uh, and then this was compounded when Aristovich, who is the is a is an advisor and a spokesperson for Zelensky, said in an interview that Ukrainian air defense had shot that missile down that landed on the building. And then straight away, the Russian the Russian media and the Russian uh, vloggers and everyone jumped on that, and it was that and. You had, an, on my threads, there was like Nikos G, someone who's sort of pro-Russian on my threads, saying this was this was a an air defense um, missile. This was as a result of the Ukrainians. It wouldn't have happened if it was Ukrainians. Why don't you call it a war crime for the Ukrainians, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. A bit similar to the Poland incident. But the problem is, Arestovich, well, apparently was saying he was just getting that information off his mate who was walking down a road in Dnipro. Uh, and it wasn't official information and he got absolutely slammed straight away and the Ukrainian Air Force said no it definitely was we don't have the Air Force defenses the defense capability to take that type of missile out of the sky it couldn't have been it literally couldn't have been the air defense so this is just wrong please only listen to the official statements that come out rather than this kind of remark in it in an interview type thing and this has been rolling on and I had this Nikos G guy in my thread saying this is an air defense I said okay give me the evidence uh, and he said, oh, there's a video evidence of there being two two explosions. And I said, that's interesting. I'd like to see that because I haven't seen that yet. By the way, um, what I have seen that sounds rather like what you're, you're documenting is the initial flash in the sky, reflected off clouds and whatnot, of the explosion. And then some seconds later, the sound of the explosion. And then the, the visuals of smoke coming up eventually and that looked like there could have been two explosions but of course we all know that light travels faster than the speed of sound and you're going to see a flash before you hear the flash so it's not two explosions it's one explosion anyway i asked him to provide me that video and he's never provided me that video and then he keeps providing me videos of arestovich saying it was shot down by air defenses yeah i know that i reported that and i reported he said that and then i reported that there are, there are these claims that have come afterwards that, that he was wrong and is speaking out of turn. Anyway, the, the point point isn't about this comment. It's about the, this story and the information and how we do our fact-checking. But the ramifications of all this is Arestovich, who is a main player. Like, he's a big communicator here. So he has his sort of daily releases of loads of information. War translated, translates them, and they are really useful. He says a lot of interesting stuff. But here, he appears to have spoken completely out of turn and on hearsay and not on actual sort of facts and certainly not on official statements. So he's offered to, he's, he's resigned um, after making, you know, these false claims. And that, uh, you, you can argue, was possibly the only thing he could do because he got himself in a right old pickle here. Alexei Arisovich announced his resignation as a freelance advisor to the president's office after falsely claiming that Ukrainian air defense had hit a Russian missile before it destroyed an apartment building in Dnipro, killing at least 44 people. So we now had the death of 44 people. Russian propaganda channels seized on Arisovich's claim 
um, oh goodness, uh, seized on his claim, uh, which was swiftly refuted by the Ukrainian Air Force, uh, as, as, as I was telling you. Right, let's go and have a look at and just give you a sense of what was going on here. This was the horrible, this is horrible, but it gives you a sense of what was going on. This is right after. <laughs> So I only play that, I know you might call that inappropriate. I mean, that's people screaming. It just gives you a sense of actually what's involved here. We've got 44 people have died and including some children in that. It was just a residential block that was completely taken out. It was hor horrific, right? Uh, you've got the sort of thing uh let's uh no it's this one so here i mean look at that poor woman just just standing up there just incredible just the destruction this was a big missile so the question is what evidence do we have that it was just that missile not air defense so this is probably one of the best videos to show you and this is the one i think this other commenter had seen and thought proved that there were two explosions What you've got there is a flash in the background and then a few seconds later, an explosion, the, the sound, because you get the flash. Light travels faster than sound by a lot, fastest thing in the, in the universe. Sound isn't, I mean, it's pretty fast, just not quite that fast. Show you that again. You're always going to see light first, a flash and then bang. As you're several kilometers away, that's what happens. You don't have two two explosions. Now, does it prove that there was an, a, 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 an explosion before then? No, I don't know. Question is, why was why was this person taking recording out of a window at that time? Of course, there are cruise missiles flying overhead. Uh, Dnipro gets a lot of attention, so that might explain that. Is trying to piece together all these bits of uh, of information. Uh, here is. I don't know that this tells us particularly whether this is a, a primary or secondary. It's just that this is the latest uh, video to come out. Uh, and this is slow motion here. Bang. But there was no explosion before there anywhere else. But you don't, again, you don't know that that explosion hadn't happened kilometers away and diverted that missile onto the building in Dnipro. Uh, and the other bit of evidence is the crows here flying off only after the building is hit and not before, you know, uh, on hearing any initial explosion of the air defense working. So another video from Dnipro is noticeable, but the crows took off after the arrival of the Russian missile. So there was no second explosion. And there were no signs of anti-aircraft fire either. Um, so no signs in the sky of other kind of smoke of explosions it's just that explosion and all the birds flying off from that they hadn't then um flown off earlier than that again only one explosion <laughs> So what we have here then to analyze is a what happens and even if the Russian narrative is what happens then what do we do with that so the evidence that the Russian narrative is true that his air defense has shot it down is Arestovich, Arestovich saying something along those lines or saying that that's what happened um, and the missile hitting the wrong target as far as the Russians would claim so the Russians would say that that the target of that missile was a piece of infra infrastructure and it didn't hit that but of course the Ukrainians can counter with uh, well it's an inaccurate missile and in fact there are claims that the particular type of missile f shot from the plane as this one was apparently g is is particularly inaccurate so and if it has a low CEP so circle error probable then 
you know, or high actually it, it it has a larger radius and and if it went wrong and all all sorts of things can happen such that that missile hits that building we have seen russian missiles hit plenty of buildings in fact there's also the the ukrainian claim that the building could have been targeted by the russian mi missile as as is often the claim that they are going for residential targets in order to break the spirit of the ukrainians so that it hit a, a residential building is i don't think it's proof either way actually uh, as to you know whether the russian narrative is true or the ukrainian narrative uh, but then looking at the footage i think that sides with the ukrainian narrative however it could be that there was an explosion that happened before that footage began and that explosion was maybe some kilometers away that hits that missile of course, or, or sends it down, but in a trajectory that, that, that while it's been hit at this point, it's got forward momentum and it comes down and hits the building. And so you don't get that caught on, on camera, but you get the building being hit caught on camera. So the, it is not completely implausible that the Russian narrative is correct. Like I wouldn't out of hand dismiss that. It's what happened in Poland uh, and the Ukrainians did deny it then. Um, and I'm not even sure what Zelensky's latest on that is, but I, I think I think that was a defence hitting that. But the the idea is, so you get some people that say, well, look, that's terrible. They, it's the air defence's fault. It's the Ukrainians' fault. They shot this thing, and it and it if they hadn't shot it out the sky, it would have it would have gone on to hit in, infrastructure. It's like yeah, but you can't. You can't have a war like that where you you have like a hundred cruise missiles flying above the sky and just go. No one shoot anything. No one's allowed to shoot any anything just in case it falls on residential area. Oh my goodness, they've killed a load of residential. They've killed a load of civilians anyway and taken out infrastructure that is effectively killing civilians and is a war crime in and of itself. Arguably, possibly, so on and so forth. And so it's a really difficult one to unpick, but. What you shouldn't do is look at it's your reference set shouldn't just be a reference set of one. So when you're doing this analysis, you shouldn't, you shouldn't say we shouldn't have hit that missile out of the sky. And this is assuming the Russian narrative is correct, and I don't think it is. But we shouldn't have hit that R Russian missile out of the sky because look what it's done. Because actually, you need to look at all the missiles and say, okay, over the course of this, they sent a thousand missiles, in, and we've shot, uh, you know, and I'm making these numbers up. We shot out of the sky two hundred of these missiles. Like one's fallen in a in a field in Poland and killed two people, and one's killed forty four people hit here. But the other hundred ninety eight have stopped a phenomenal amount of people dying. So even if the Russian narrative is correct, it's absolutely necessary that they try and shoot these things out of the sky. And you need to look at the whole picture to get a sense of the the moral evaluation of doing that, rather than just this one isolated incident. But that's, again, assuming that the Russian narrative is correct. And I don't think it is. Either way, if you are an aggressor, if you are an aggressive country who is firing missiles into uh, a, a sovereign nation to help destroy that nation, then that is itself morally impermissible for the reasons that, that Russia have given for the war. It's just absolutely not on. So my analysis would be that it's most probably it's a missile that hit a residential building uh, for one reason or another, and there could be any number of reasons that that it just hit that. I think it's most probable that happened. But even if it was hit by air defence missiles, that is unacceptable that Russia would be sending missiles over a, a civilian city like that to to try and hit, like supposedly hit civilian infrastructure just that is unacceptable and the whole kind of platform of russia's position here is unacceptable they just they don't have uh the moral high ground to take here in any way shape or form when assessing you know what happened in Dnipro. yeah let me know your thoughts uh please like subscribe and share um uh, all the ways you can help my channel are in the description below. Really appreciate that. You guys are amazing. And I'll be back with you for a frontline update tomorrow morning.